Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. Tracy Denton represents the future of politics, at least I hope so. She left her job as a lawyer to work in the Dean campaign, and that campaign never stopped. Now she's on her way to the top of the Democratic Party. So how about that? That's pretty good, huh? Well, I wouldn't say I'm on my way to the top of the Democratic well, Party, but... Uh... You may well be, and I hope you are. So tell me, you um, were you always interested in politics when you were a kid? I think I was always politically conscious, um, but I never really got involved until 2000. I started volunteering uh, for Gore when I was in law school. Um, was your family politically interested? Yes, actually, they're Republicans, and I yeah. was actually raised Republican, uh, uh -huh. but always um, moderate Republicans, pro-choice. I always cared a lot about civil rights, and I, I had a lot of of the what I call bleeding heart liberal views as I was growing up. I think I just didn't associate them with one party right. or another. Yeah. So then you went to law school? Yes. And yes. that's when you said you started in the Gore campaign? Yes. I really um, was familiar with George Bush and did not want him to get elected president. And I really liked Al Gore. And um, because I was such a political novice in 2000, I was under the impression that Georgia was a swing state. So I was in law school at Emory, and I thought, I'm going to go out there and, and, and help us take Georgia. And of course, that, that didn't happen, but it was a, it was a phenomenal learning experience and, yeah. and a great way to learn about get out the vote and, um, and, and, and how voters make up their mind about who to vote for and whether to go to the polls at all that day. It was, it's a very interesting, it's sobering, mm -hmm. isn't it? Sometimes yes. it's scary yes. sometimes <laughs> also, isn't it? Absolutely. I don't know. I always, you always wonder, have you ever been on a jury? I have, actually, yes. It's interesting because that works that process, it seems to me. It does, it does. And I always want the political part of it to work also, and sometimes I don't think it does. Well, sure, jury duty is mandatory, and yeah. voting is not, so yeah. that might be part of maybe, the problem. Maybe the difference. Mm -hmm. So then you, you became a lawyer, you passed the bar. Yes. <laughs> and you, you joined a law firm. Yes, I worked for uh, Lowenstein Sandler, a terrific firm. Uh, in New Jersey with a New York office. And um, I really liked the people I was working with, but the private practice of law is extremely stressful, extremely stressful. And so I always had kind of thought that I might leave to go on and do something pro bono. I didn't realize I would be quitting my job to go work for uh, this a presidential candidate. candidate. <laughs> so how far into the campaign did you decide to do that? Well, it was actually June of 2003, and I was working on a huge trial, which was supposed to go to trial in, in uh, June 2nd, I believe it was, and then the judge fell off a ladder literally fell off a ladder. That's not code for anything. And uh, so I'm sitting at my desk with some time, and I thought, okay, I, I know there's this presidential primary going on. I've heard about this Dean guy. I've heard that about was a year guys. before, though, wasn't it? Yeah, June of 2003. So the so primary was in The primary was going to be in 2004, yes. So I got up on the internet, and on the Dean campaign uh, site, it said, come to a meetup tomorrow night. And I thought, a meetup? What's a meetup? And, uh, and so I went, and they played a speech that he gave, I believe, before the California Democratic Party. They played a video of it, and I was immediately hooked. And I was uh, talking around my law firm the next day, saying, can we get this guy to come here and everything? And, uh, and of course, as you now know, fast forwarding <laughs> a year and a few months, I'm hosting meetups. And to my great delight, Ronnie well, Eldridge, legend of the Upper West Side, to came to my but meetup. But tell me <laughs> something. What was it about Dean that interested you? Um, there was a, there's a general and a specific. The general thing, I think, was the way he talked about the issues and the combination of fiscal responsibility with still this idea that government can help people and we don't need to abandon social programs in order to be fiscally responsible. Did, the war, did Iraq play any role in that? A lot of people came to the Dean campaign through the Iraq War. Yeah. I, I was not one of those people. I think that That's I am against the war and I, and, and I really do need, think we need a more... A, a very different foreign policy, and and I, I I don't like George Bush's position on foreign policy, and I, I obviously agree more with Dean on that. But I didn't come to Dean through the war. I think I I came to it um, and uh, of the general sense of the way he talked about the issues, um, the civil unions bill. I think it was extremely brave for standing up for that. When I first heard about it, I thought this guy's never going to be president. But then you you read about the yeah. way he talks about it and and listen to him, and it and it did make sense that he could do that. And and I think the very specific thing is in his speech he said uh, the University of Michigan's affirmative action program that was being debated at the time. And he said George Bush used the word quotas six or seven times when talking about the University of Michigan's affirmative action program. George Bush knows that the University of Michigan does not use quotas, have, has never used quotas, and that quotas is a racially charged term that's designed to appeal to people's fears that they're going to lose their job or their place in university to a person of color. And I thought, thank God somebody is finally talking about the way the Republicans divide us, mm -hmm. because it's so true. I've been so upset with the Republicans for using that word, quota, for so many years. And the Democrats just say, mend it, don't end it. And that soundbite yeah. has not been working. Right. And, yeah. and so Dean brought a very fresh approach to that, which so, I was because, happy to see. And that's, uh, that's something that mm -hmm. he, that's happened, I mean, that we need to do on a 
broader scale on much many more issues. Absolutely, right? to, absolutely. To be able to absolutely. explain them in a different way and yes. not to be on the defensive. Yes. So you went to work. So you quit. I did. I talked to my boss. Um, he sort of didn't let me quit at first, but then he did. He was extremely supportive. And, um, and I went part-time for a while and was trying to do both. I was not working. So I did um, eventually quit the job to go work in, in the grassroots stuff for Howard Dean. And that started from this meetup? It started from this meetup. So tell yeah. us what a meetup is. A meetup is uh, more, uh, less formal than a meeting, but a little bit more formal than your average social gathering. Um, essentially, meetup.com is a company, not affiliated with the Dean campaign or anything else, that allows people to sort of organize on the internet to meet with people in a common interest area. Um, whether it's Cocker Spaniels or Witches. Witches was actually, uh, Witchcraft was actually the number one meetup before the Dean campaign came along. <laughs> so, you know, you had this situation around the country where Howard Dean was on the political map for his opposition to the war and his support for civil unions. And people were sort of getting to know him, but they didn't want to move to Vermont or New Hampshire where the campaign was. So meetup.com was there and people started organizing these meetups in their and communities. And it was the, was the Dean campaign, and then, uh, then other mm -hmm. candidates later on had meetups. Absolutely, absolutely. So was the yeah. Dean campaign the first one to to use that? I'm not, I'm actually not sure. I know the Clark campaign had a great grassroots structure, so Isn't I'm not sure who started exactly the and first meetup. And who meet did meetup.com, do you know? Meetup.com is a private company. Isn't that, that yeah, it is. It's fascinating. So, so you had people around the country forming these meetups for Howard Dean, and then morphing that into grassroots groups. Like they might start a meetup in San Francisco, and then that became San Francisco for Dean, which is now San Francisco for Democracy. You know, this this yes. sort of thing. And uh -huh. so we had meetups in New York City. Um, some grassroots people started NYC for Dean, grassroots group, not affiliated with the campaign, and 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 that kept going forward. And now we have Democracy for NYC. So. So you went, and so mm -hmm. you. Came came to this, or, this mm -hmm. meetup, you mm -hmm. met a lot of people, mm -hmm. you then decided you're going to work with them, mm -hmm. and you guys went off and organized yourselves. Yeah, uh, basically New York was a Super Tuesday s state, uh -huh. um, so we were organizing that there. Was and the day that we had all those primaries around different states. Exactly, exactly, and so we did think that New York was going to be important in terms of outreach, and that was very important to me because in New Jersey, uh, where I was working at my law firm and where I grew up, I, I, lived, I always lived in New York City, but I worked in New Jersey. It's, it's, it's a frustrating state to try to get involved in politics because the primary is in June, so nobody cares about the voters in New Jersey. And uh, the general, it's, it's you know, not supposed to be a swing state. And it's the highest per capita income in the country along with Connecticut. So fundraising is, is all that they do in New Jersey. And it was very frustrating when you're a lawyer and you say you're interested in politics, yeah. everybody it's, wants you to write a check. It's the same thing. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. right. So it's, you looked at New yes. York as being up front, more, closer. Right, I, right. Of course, it, that happens here, it too. It proved to be too late. And, and also, yes. people don't campaign here because they're sure it's a, a democratic state. Right, in terms of the general election. Yeah. Now, in the primary, I think it's also important because uh, yeah. during during a primary campaign, it's always important how the presidential candidates are polling in New York. So I do feel like the work that we did kind of kept Dean's poll numbers high in the beginning, and we tried to yeah. keep it high later on. So I never felt like anything we did was kind of a waste in time, of time yeah. in terms of helping the Dean campaign. So did you participate, for instance, in the selection of slates, since you were not part of the formal Dean campaign organization? Well, it's interesting that you ask that, because the, the headquarters office in New York essentially did fundraising and these delegates sl yeah. slates in the ballot and then and then did some outreach right. and we coordinated with them on that um, or worked with them on that. I shouldn't use the word coordinate, but they did tell us if you know anybody out there that you think would make a great delegate, a, co a community leader, let us know. So they did have that. Uh, they did have a, a respect for sort of bringing the grassroots people in in that way. But I don't think um, I ever sort of knew enough about the process to participate. in. So that. how many so. people did you get into this group? Um, well, uh, another uh, guy, Jonathan Halverson, started it with several right. people, and I came on board. Um, it's hard to say with grassroots politics on the Internet because you have a certain number of yeah. email addresses. Yeah. Um, but uh, there was 19 meetups in Manhattan at the height of right. the Dean campaign, 28 throughout New York City. And people were coming every month, the first Wednesday of every month, to these meetups to find out about him. And they were regularly... Uh, um, events such as we're going to be passing out flyers in Union Square, we're going to pass out flyers up in Harlem, we're going to pass out flyers in Hell's Kitchen. There was a huge, the village uh, Halloween parade. We had a huge um, a puppet sort of thing of Dr. Dean that the Brooklyn for Dean people <laughs> made that was phenomenal. So, and, and passing out flyers all the way to people there to kind of spread the word about it. So people really felt like the Dean campaign was in their community. And you were able to raise your own money? It was, it was kind of, um, I wasn't in, as much involved in, in the, the money aspect of yeah. what NYC for Dean do, did, but it was essentially photocopies and web space. And web space is not that expensive, and people can kind of, you know, contribute and do it themselves. So, but, I mean, mm -hmm. it's fascinating because it's 
formed the basis now for democracy yes, for, yes, for America, yes, which yes. is now democracy for New York, New York City, right. and all the different places right. around the there's, country. There's several coalition groups across the country. So there's Democracy for America, which on paper is about 14 people in an office in Burlington, Vermont. As a movement, it is all these supporters, 700,000 across the country and various groups. In democracy for yes. America came out of the Dean campaign. Yes, it was basically, Dean for America was the campaign. It sort of morphed into Democracy for America, a political action campaign. Now, what's ACT? Act America is, coming together. America coming together is um, is is separate. That is a coalition of many groups that existed, you know, I think before 2004, before even 2000, that came together because they all wanted to elect a Democrat and and remove George Bush from the White House, and they didn't want to duplicate efforts. So they came together, and Democracy for America, you know, put their name on that coalition also, and it I was a, co a coalition to organize people in swing states to work on that I behalf, see. but also organize sending progressives from other states into, to, into, in, into swing states to do that. Uh, so now you're continuing. Yes. Dr. Dean yes. <laughs> started this group. Yes. Now he's made that incredible turn from heading up this group we never to the Democratic imagined. National we never Committee. Could have right. yes. So now he's running the Democratic <laughs> Party. <laughs> yes. And you guys are still enlisting people and, and working. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we never could have imagined that Howard Dean would be the chair of the DNC yeah. after all this. And it's great, and it's terrific. And I, and I really do admire what he said uh, about going to communities where the Democratic Party has been ignored in Mississippi, Alabama, Kansas, and helping them build up again. So as much as you know, people are always asking me, oh, could you get him on the phone? Could you talk, you know, can you talk to him? Can you send him a message? I feel like I don't want to bother him. Let him go <laughs> you know, yeah. do what he set out to do in the, in the, at the DNC and, and get the grassroots involved, and we'll keep doing what we're doing with Democracy for NYC. Now, what's so. the purpose of Democracy for NYC? Um, the purpose of Democracy for NYC is to help ordinary citizens get involved in politics at the local, state, and national level. We're dealing with a base that got involved because of a presidential campaign, and to get progressives to focus on how these issues that they care about, the environment, civil rights, the economy, foreign policy, how this plays out at a local level is, is difficult but not impossible. And, and, and Howard Dean has been very much a spokesman for the idea of you've got to get involved at the local level. And that's where we're going to need advice from people like you who do know how these, uh, well, these issues play out but at the it's local a, level. But, but you're, you're, you're moving in in territory that local democratic clubs and things always had thought was theirs. That is true. That is true. Although a lot of the Democratic clubs have been extremely welcoming. Right. Um, it, 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 it varies from club to club. Um, Democracy for America does want us all to get involved in our local Democratic clubs, and we've been telling our members that. And some people say, I already am. Come join me. Some people say, OK, fine, I'll go do it. And other people say, Why? I'm not joining my local Democratic club, or let's use the buddy system and go together. I, there's a sense of, there's a stereotype out there of what a Democratic club is. And it's a smoke-filled back room of people who don't do anything. And that's not uh, entirely true, I don't think. I don't think that that's always true of Democratic clubs. But I don't, again, <laughs> I, I, I've spent you know, yes. 50 years with mm -hmm. Democratic clubs, and mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the image is either. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I joined it at, in the 52, I think, 1952. Mm -hmm. right, it was the beginning, or it had already started in the, the late 40s and mm -hmm. 50, 51, when veterans were coming back from World War II. Oh, okay. And had decided they were didn't like this Tammany, you know, boss controlled political Democratic Party and they wanted to have some say about president and all that kind of stuff. So they got involved in politics. It's very similar to you. It was the Committee for Democratic Voters that was formed with Eleanor Roosevelt and Herbert Lehman, who was the United States Senator then. Okay. And a few very affluent lawyers and stuff who were able to fund it. Uh, and the Committee for Democratic Voters was the umbrella group and what happened was a lot of young and other people who were interested in good government, because mm -hmm. the patronage and the tie-in between the Tammany organization and the government was so strong. You know, I mean, it controlled everything. So they ran primary fights against the clubs. The, Interesting. The club that mm -hmm. was in the district where I lived mm -hmm. was called the Isidore Greenberg Association. Mm -hmm. and it was a district leader was a guy named Izzy Greenberg, mm -hmm. and they ran a card party twice a week. Mm -hmm. And the women had an auxiliary, <laughs> and they served donuts and coffee. <laughs> and nobody could see the books, and nobody knew how much money passed. Mm -hmm. And of course, there was no television then, so captains and that whole canvassing structure was very important because that was what took the voters the message of who was running. You know, right? Getting the message out there about who's right. running is that's key. That's never changed. What's happened? What did change is the way the message gets out. I mean, it sure. used to be people, then it became television. Now, and it's the internet, and it, you know that expands. 
Um, but I think that that influenced the diminishing of the public, of people's role in politics. Well, absolutely, but I, I, I have a, a question for you, and it can't exactly be answered today, but is it better to change an institution, an institution from within the institution or from outside the institution? Well, um, could people have gotten involved in Tammany yeah. Hall and tried to change it that way, or would that have been, well, it sounds you know, like that would have been What happened was a lot of the reformers uh -huh. aged out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of the reformers who stayed in became part of the organization. Mm -hmm. Then they become the inside players, mm -hmm. and they may not do exactly the same kind of thing that Tammany used to do, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, Con Edison with their manhole and covers, manhole covers, you know, the manhole covers yes, in the streets. That was a great source of patronage. You used to have a manhole inspector. Uh -huh. And an inspector was usually a captain of a club that delivered a, a certain amount of votes. Yes. That was the patronage. That was the present you got. If you were a good captain and you, your election district carried your candidate, the organization's candidate, by a large amount of votes, he would give you, the district leader would give you an assignment. All right, you're going to be the inspector of the manhole at 90th Street and Broadway. Right. Now, depending also on how much he liked you, <laughs> was how much you got paid. Some, some people got paid thousands of dollars a year mm -hmm. to inspect that manhole. I mean, that was just a payoff. The question was how much the money that captain kept, how much went back to the district leader. All of right. that was part of the thing. We don't have that now, but we do have There's certain patronage. Different Aspects ways of patronage. Of, yes. And, so, and I think mm -hmm. every organization matures and then rots. I mean, it's like a leaf mm -hmm. on a tree or people, we age mm -hmm. and then we decay and we die, you know. And I think that's what happens with organizations. So there's a, a wave of it. The, and um, I think there's a role for both. I think, you know, people in and people out. The patronage system is fascinating because that's not why we're involved in politics. Right. I, our member, I don't want to run for office. I'm not doing this for a political career. Um, uh, the, our members are just really interested in issues, from social security to what's development in their communities, everything. They're interested in issues. And so it's almost, we don't even, I don't even understand the complexities of the patronage system, but it's fascinating that we found that we have to explain to elected officials that that's not, we what almost have to define for? ourselves by what we're not. And, and the reason we sometimes have to do that is because some of our supporters will, will say things to elected officials like, if we get you elected, will you hire Heather and Tracy? You know, Heather's the director and that's not, <laughs> and we have to so, tell them, know. we're not, you know, we're not looking for jobs or to Manhattan Borough president candidates because we're meeting with all of them yeah. and we're, we're bringing them to meetups uh, you know as you know it's Margarita get Lopez. Appoint, get and, appointed to community board. Right and that's what somebody <laughs> said will you appoint DFA members to community boards. Now I think what this member meant was will you look for sort Outside. of new blood and yeah. outsiders right. but the way that comes across it sounds right. like we're looking for patronage. So now our our, we're adding to our spiel that we give to candidates when we sit down with them is, look, we're not looking for jobs. You're, you know, are some of our people going to send you resumes if you get elected? Sure. If you don't hire them, are we going to be upset with you? No, not at all. So well, it's... you know, a, a role for an organization like yours, for instance, take the community board, which is the most local of Absolutely, public yes. offices or yes. appointments. In New York City, yes. There's no salary, but there, is, mm -hmm. there are responsibilities, and mm -hmm. it is part of the government process. It's mm -hmm. part of the URP, uh, mm -hmm. which is the land use review thing and everything else. I mean, is is the way it's established now the most desirable way, and you guys should be looking at that. Maybe yes, you should change yes, that way. Yes, yes. I mean, these are people who get appointed by mm -hmm. the city council member and the borough president. Mm -hmm. Do they necessarily reflect the area that they're they're representing? I don't think so. So, but could we really have an election of members? I'm not sure about that either, since right. we've had such bad, you know, experiences with school boards and things. But. I would think that there's always a need for outside organizations to look in, to look Absolutely. over and Absolutely. complain and uh -huh. suggest and cajole and change. And then there's always a need for people to be inside who respond to those people. Right. Now, right, with the Democratic right. clubs, I just don't know. They used to be great sources, and it, it almost sounds like uh, the meetup is replacing it. I don't know how social it is or what the age of people is. but. Uh, in my day early on. I met two husbands in political clubs. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I did pretty well. <laughs> I'll tell but, our members that so that they will get um, more involved. Sure. But they were, they were large. There were hundreds of people who were members mm -hmm. of these clubs. You never mm -hmm. had a meeting with less than 100 people. Mm -hmm. Now you can go and I, I think they have 25 and people mm -hmm. are pretty old or they're maybe after the, this la last election they're younger. But um, they're, they don't have the spirit they used to have because they also don't have the power. I, it's a very complicated situation. I think what you guys are doing, though, is a very important thing, is to talk about the issues, which is what you're yes, doing. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I went to your meetup. That was yes, the first time. Yes, you did. And as you know, we have right. a huge age range. There right. All, all ages. Mm -hmm. And the meetup was so interesting because mm -hmm. I've been on the internet and I've gotten meetup mm -hmm. invitations since the political campaigns and then everybody started mm -hmm. having meetups. 
But this one, it's in the basement of a bar. It's in the basement of a bar. <laughs> <laughs> what was going on in the bar was one of those marathon meets. Oh, yeah. We used to be upstairs in the bar, but the, this bar has become very popular. So it's, 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 it's eight-minute dating, and, it's, and, it's, yeah. and, and sometimes it's Protestants 34 to 39, and other times it's Catholics <laughs> 25 to 29. And it's so, such a yes. whole new world for people like me because, yes. you know, so mm -hmm. many people are meeting people that way right. or on the Internet. Right. absolutely. So it was downstairs, and that was a problem, too, because I think there was somebody who couldn't, it wasn't handicapped Yes, accessible. we do need, we need, do need to get better. Or, uh, as we were during the campaign yeah. with having more handicap yeah. accessible meetups and publicizing that so yeah. that people know. Yeah. Um, and Margarita Lopez has talked with us about right. that and I, and I really credit her for standing up for yeah. the rights of but people. But there it was in the basement and mm -hmm. it was a great meeting. How yes. many people do you think were there? Uh, according to the sign-up sheet, 46, I yeah. think. Yeah. So it, it, was, was it was a great meeting mm -hmm. and you talked about a lot of issues. I mean, yes. Let's talk about yes. some of those issues that you're interested in right now. Um, sure. I, I, I will just say from coming into that, I, I've always known that I was supposed to get involved in local politics, but I felt like before the Dean campaign, every time I asked some about it, I would get a soap opera of yeah. so and so supported so and so in this yeah. primary, so yeah. this person's not going to. And and what I was really interested in was issues. So that's part of our our struggle and what we do is to make local politics very issue centered uh, on that basis. Um, one important issue is verified voting. Uh, a lot of progressives know that it's an issue nationally. We're very concerned verified about verified voting yeah. is now yes. the debate over how yes. we're going to cast votes. How right? we're going to cast votes in light of needing to become more technolo technologically advanced than the the chads in Florida in 2000 but not wanting to become so technologically advanced that systems are susceptible to fraud and, and mismanagement. And New York has a particular yes. problem because our machines are... Right. We have lever machines. There's, well, the yeah. national voting, what's that called, the national voting? HAVA, the Help America Vote Act, right. was passed after 2000. And it set a deadline for it meeting did. certain requirements. It set right? a 2006 deadline to update voting systems. But it's the, but that is if you want the federal money. So a lot of people believe that we have to update our voting systems, but the reality is we have to do it if we want the federal money. Now, what I've been told is that New York legislators are not going to give up federal money, so we're going to get something passed. Uh, but some people say give up the federal money, keep the lever machines, and fix them. Um, other people say, okay, we don't want to, we certainly don't want a, uh, paperless voting. There has to be a paper trail. And I think the issue is whether you call that a paper trail or a paper ballot. We have to, it has to be called a paper ballot because if there's a discrepancy between the total in the computer at the end of the day and the pieces of paper, we want the paper to govern. The record. Yeah, to, the paper record. to be the official yeah. record. But uh, another method and one that progressives are quickly embracing is, is paper ballots, is uh, something along the lines of a Scantron sheet, but not as complicated as what we took the SATs on. A scan, what is that? Um, Will you, you, you mark the, the you, you mark in the circles with your number two pencil, but much less complicated, yeah. much easier to understand. You do the paper ballot and, it's, and, and then there's an optical scan machine at the precinct and you feed that through at the end of the day and you go home. So we have a paper ballot and then and the precinct it. has the optical scan machine which is the technology that allows us to count the votes right. quicker. And um, there's a lot of good reviews of optical scan machines. We, um, we are, you know, there's obviously concerns that you don't want it to take too long for people to vote because right. we don't want even longer lines uh, right. out the door in important upcoming elections. But the progressive community seems to be rallying around that, though we're still taking feedback from people who say, I don't trust optical scan machines. Um, I'm concerned about this. Let's stick with lever machines. But it seems like the progressive community is trending towards What does liberal scan. mean to you? What does liberal mean to me? First of all, I don't think it's a bad word. <laughs> I, I, am, I am very upset that we've let the Republicans scare us into this. But I, I understand um, why Democrats don't often want to answer journalists that say, are you a liberal? Because they know whatever they say after that, the Republicans are going to turn it into a soundbite in a television commercial. So and it's scare better people. to be a progressive yes. than a liberal. See, I always thought Progressives a is, liberal was yes. more middle of the road and a, and a progressive was more to the left. Uh, I the way I see progressive <laughs> now is it's the new word we're using because we don't want to use liberal because right, I was raised right. with, uh, yes. with a rose of a, a family that was totally uh -huh. identified with Franklin Roosevelt. I've, I've always thought of myself as a liberal, so uh -huh. I always think when I don't know quite what progressive. I am not afraid of the word liberal. I am, yeah. I am proud right. to be a liberal, but I'm never running for public we're office. We're into our last <laughs> three minutes, so okay. I want to. So I want to. Mm -hmm. So you think mm -hmm. that you will be able to provide to people the ability to draw them into the political process. To make by it their fun and to make it and educational and to not make it the typical uh, sort of soap opera thing of who's running against who right. and, and come to this, this meeting and meet these people and write a check. So we how do you make pay it for this? How do we pay for this? Well, we are actually having a uh, an event, a fundraiser, if anybody would like to come. I believe on it's on Wednesday, Wednesday, March 16th. So I believe it's the first day that this show uh -huh. is airing. Um, our website is democracyfornyc.org, and the invitation's on the front page. You can send an email to finance at dfnyc.org if you're interested, or you can 
call me. Can I give them my phone number? Sure. 646 251 0680. If you're interested in attending, it's 646 251 0680. And if you're interested in more information about meetups and about democracy yes, for or New York City, call me for any reason. Absolutely. So, do Absolutely. you organize lobbying trips? Um, we have joined lobbying trips that have been organized by other groups. For example, we're not a one issue organization, but there are some organizations that may take on. Uh, one issue for a temporary or permanent amount of time. The Brennan Center, for example, uh, organized a lobbying trip to Albany to, to work on reforming Albany on January 6th. And we joined that trip and, and the efforts that the Brennan Center did on that and helped get our people contacting their state legislators about, uh, about reform in Albany and that they wanted that. So that's the sort of thing we're doing. If somebody else is already doing it and it's a matter of plugging our members in, that's the most efficient way to do this to, so that progressives are not duplicating efforts. So you, 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 your effort is to reach the largest group yes, that you can. Yes, absolutely, yes. And the hope is then that they will, will participate in politics? Yes, is that part participate, vote in primaries, first of all. Yeah. As you know, it's so important to vote in primaries because in New York City, the people who vote in the Democratic primary are the people that have the power. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do have a Republican mayor, but for the most part, in every elected office, the Democrat is going to win, for the so most you, part. So you're not you've got necessarily to the a Democratic Democrat. organization. A lot of your, most of your people most likely are Democrats having come No, from but we welcome everyone, and we don't exist to just help the Democratic Party, no questions right. asked. We exist to change it, strengthen it, improve it, and we're really about issues. We're about electing socially, res socially progressive, fiscally responsible candidates. Now, in New York City, that's going to tend to be Democrats. In other parts of the country, it may be some Democrats and not others. And in some parts of the country, that may be Republican candidates. So. See, and you're trying to make it understandable, right? Yes, we're trying to make and it to understandable. To develop a language that bridges all different groups yes, and people. Yes, I find myself sometimes uh, getting, uh, becoming knowledgeable about what's going on in New York politics that I start talking about, oh, the, you know, the primary in Senate yeah. District 34 with Jeff Klein. And, and then I realize I'm talking in, in and code, and language. I need to bring it out and say, look, we've got a primary yeah. going on, and one candidate supports um, equal rights yeah. for gays and lesbians, and the other candidate doesn't, so let's get out there and volunteer. Well, you know. Tracy, I hope people, <laughs> many people join you, and I Great. wish you very much luck. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank, Thank you. you.